All right. Uh, we'll go ahead and uh, get started on to um, our uh, final keynote on the day uh, for, the, for the Threat Intelligence Practitioner Summit. Um, I'm very happy to have uh, Andrea here uh, to actually talk about uh, the human side of all of this. Um, and this is an area that I'm particularly passionate about, that um, cybersecurity is really not just a technical discipline, but is also a very much a human discipline. And so this is a very important topic, and I'm glad that we uh, can have a talk on this, on this point. So, Andrea? All right. Thanks, Michael. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming, and uh, Virus Bolton for hosting this and for you guys for sponsoring this. Uh, it's been great hearing so much about data sharing and collaboration, actually, over the last two days. And so... Uh, I think a lot of this fits into a lot of themes I've been seeing across uh, the two days of talks so far. Um, just quick background, I'm trained as an analyst, a social scientist, worked in the Department of Defense doing a lot of threat intel analysis, uh, took that into cybersecurity realm now, and I've been working at a variety of startups, and so what you'll see throughout this talk is sort of an integration of various aspects uh, of my career that blend the, the social, social element with the technical element, and why I think secure sharing is so foundational to uh, this important inflection point we're actually at right now in the world system, as democracies are on decline and authoritarian, especially digital authoritarianism is on the rise, secure sharing can provide a nice counterweight to some of those trends. Um, so what we'll be going over uh, quite a bit, first I want to talk about the status quo that's going on right now as far as uh, the mountains of data that's out there, but we still don't have access to the right data, and talk about some of the reasons why that's the case. Uh, then I want to take a look at the socio-technical socio look at some recommendations for how we can build up some of the secure sharing and overcome the state of deserts issue. And then I'll get into a tale of two futures, uh, one with sharing and one uh, without, and why that is going to be so essential as we look ahead at the future of the internet. So first, um, I won't spend a ton of time on this, we're all well versed in it, but we know those bubble charts just keep getting bigger, we keep seeing the Marriott and the Equifax and the <laughs> Yahoo, and um, so I had this chart once a few weeks ago, and literally the talk right after me had the big bubble chart <laughs> with each of the, 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 um, the breaches. And so we know this, and, then, and that's problematic, obviously. And it gets back to the proliferation. Uh, if anyone saw Selena's talk a little earlier today, she talked about this as well in both the IT and the OT worlds as far as prol proliferation. And it's a big issue, both for targets, but also for the tactic and tools, and then the threat actors. Uh, we're, and this, again, obviously could be a whole talk in itself, but there's a lot of diffusion of the capabilities from nation states to a whole range of actors, um, and along with the tools and tactics that they're doing, and really we're at a point where seemingly no target is off limits. And so given that, because we're constantly hearing about all these breaches um, and all the actors that are rising, the proliferation of it, because of all the headline fatigue we have in this area, you know, there's a sense of you know, fatalism that has been permeating where our, our major paradigms right now in our industry are assuming breach, privacy is dead, humans are the weakest links, and it basically you know, leads, to, leads to just a, a lack of faith and you know, almost defeatism uh, as we're trying to approach this really, really important issue. And so is isn't to say that there aren't, you know, the data points don't uh, provide some impetus for why this is why, what, what some dominant paradigms are, but that we need to move beyond it and actually aspire towards a different future than that and not just, to, not just accept this as our current reality or the future reality. We need to push back on that. But given, and part of the reason why, and you know, why we're at this point, um, what the repercussions of accepting that as, as the status quo is that there's this data hoarding epidemic, epidemic that's going on. And so we're locking down data uh, either for fear of it being stolen um, by the range of attackers that I talked about through compliance, we see GDPR and a whole range of uh, data protection uh, policies that are really popping up. I think Europe's been a big uh, leader in that area. We're seeing Brazil's following something similar. The U.S. has California's law coming up. So it's both the attackers that are coming uh, after the data and the compliance regimes that are leading organizations and communities to really just want to hoard that data, keep it all to themselves, um, and not share it. And the other aspect of the sharing is that because of third party breaches that are going on, that's another reason why people are, are uh, concerned about sharing. And whether it's intentional or not, that those third party uh, data compromises have really instilled a lack of trust uh, amongst organizations and amongst businesses to share and collaborate with each other. And so why does this matter? And so we are seeing these data styles through the hoarding that's going on. For most organizations, it hurts the bottom line, and that, that's you know, plain and simple. It limits their ability to actually reap business value from a lot of the data that they have, and we see that both in security with threat intelligence, but also just other organizations across anything from healthcare to energy, 
um, medical industry and so forth, it's hurting the bottom line and it's hurting the ability to innovate. Uh, it hurts security. And we actually just had a really great panel that explained most of that, so I don't need to go into it too much. The benefits of collaborating and sharing uh, are really beneficial for security, protection, um, for safety. The absence of which, which we see an awful lot of, is actually really detrimental. It's decreasing our visibility. I mean, we've said actually a couple of times, you only see a part of the pie. And so we're, we're, we, ha we lack the situational awareness that goes on. And then also fragments the community. So instead of working together as a cohesive unit, it leads to distrust in different islands of, of information going on uh, within the community, which basically means that separate insights are being reaped across the area, but there's no holistic information that really can help innovate. And so those of us that are researchers and analysts, we don't have enough access to the right data that we need. We know we're not getting a complete picture. We, are, we know we're only able to see the bits that we have access to. And so that's what you know, I think of as, as the data deserts. Despite the fact that you know, we hear about the big data, you know, uh, big data trends that are going on, there's a data deluge, like whatever, um, whatever kind of paradigm you want to think about with that, it's really leading to that scarcity. And it's that data scarcity that's hurting us right now from innovating, from collaborating, and really strengthening our defenses. And there are real world consequences. And this was interesting, actually, just two days ago in uh, Politico, they were talking about ransomware and how the unreported attacks for ransomware is actually leaving it to places where local uh, law enforcement, um, local governments, cybersecurity firms, basically you name it, anyone who's concerned about ransomware, which at this point are, you know, is almost everyone, uh, they're not getting a full picture of the threat. And so I think it's really interesting talking about that, and we'll get into some of the reasons why that is uh, when we get into some of the socio-technical aspects of it. But we're seeing real-world effects of, of organizations and governments not being able to defend themselves because they don't have a complete picture of actually what's going on. And, and ransomware is really a good example of that. And so just to kind of summarize, you know, the state of the state, you know, there's a whole vast amount of you know, the marketing material, but not, not a large amount of high-quality vetted data that we all need access to as researchers and analysts. And so as researchers and analysts, we're only seeing a portion of the pie. And this is actually a really good um, Washington Post article by University of Tulsa professor Tyler Moore, who wrote about cybersecurity is one of the biggest problems in cybersecurity is, is the lack of data sharing and the data scarcity problem that we're seeing right now. So this gets to the data paradox, and we'll get to another paradox in a little bit. But we're seeing on the one hand, so much data is out there across the, the, all the views that you want, but researchers and analysts are not accessing the right data at the right time that they need to really provide strength and strengthen our defenses. And so how can we fix this? How can we create a system where we're sharing the data and we're innovating and we're delivering value to our customers and strengthen defenses for our customers? And so I'm gonna steal this from Martin. I think he just left and he allowed me to put this on there. So we, we, you know, one of my signs earlier, he talked about the users as the weakest link. And then there was a you know, funny pushback on that, that well, you know, it's just, we're not allowed to say that anymore. And it's not that we're so allowed to say it anymore is that we have to actually treat them as, as features, not bugs in our system. And so we actually need to integrate them into, as we're building solutions, understanding humans are part of it, not a bug, and we can't take them out of it. And so this actually led me to change the title of the talk because I thought that was just brilliant that he, uh, that he did that. So I'd like him to make shirts of it for the next virus bulletin, we'll see. <laughs> and so how do we get about doing that? How do we build these systems and processes uh, for secure sharing? And so I'll walk through uh, each of these. Incentives, trust, and usability. And each of these kind of cross over a, a different balance in each one from the social systems to the technical systems and really the integration across the two. So we'll start off with incentives. And so the carrots and the sticks, that's, you know, if you do like intro, intro to international relations, you learn that incentives matter, you can either reward or you can punish. That's basically the foundation for incentives and they matter as far as influencing and, and altering behavior. But for way too long, when we think thought about data sharing within our industry, it's been one way. And so if you, the example I gave earlier about uh, the FBI and the government not necessarily getting all the ransomware data that they need, part of it is that lack of trust, a part of it's the belief that you're gonna give the data one way, but never get any benefits out of it coming the other way. And I've heard that over and over again from organizations who don't wanna work with the government because they, they don't see anything coming back in their favor. They see the government as hoarding the data, not providing that benefit in return. And um, you know, it was interesting that the panel beforehand really emphasized the reciprocity of it, which is great because uh, that gets into some of the, the stuff that I'll be talking about. And so if you look at the research on actually on incentives and building trust and really building uh, collaborative social networks, you have to look at the density of the, of the networks, the structure, size, and directionality. All these different aspects of the networks really impact the incentives of the members and the quality of information available to them. 
And that last part is what I really want to focus on, that based on the network and based on how the, the information flows are going, impact significantly the amount of data that's available within those networks themselves. Um, and this is a really great book if anyone wants to read more about network theory and how it's impacting uh, relations and security. Um, the Chessboard and the Web is a really interesting book that hits upon that. So we need to think about it from more of a network's perspective when we're thinking about data sharing uh, within our industry. And it must be so that it rises, you know, so all boats rise up. It can't just be that's beneficial to one, not beneficial to another. The, again, going back to the incentives, they have to be there to demonstrate there's reciprocity for it and that the mutual benefits are, are there for the secure sharing. Absent that kind of network and absent that kind of directionality within it, you, individuals and organizations simply aren't going to be sharing with one another. And so we want to focus on creating a network system where we've got all the FUD that we talked about earlier. We're very well known for that, the fear, uncertainty, and doubt. But making it so the incentives are there, so the fear of missing out actually overwhelms the FUD that is dominating the industry. And I think we can get there and talk about there's some signs that we're getting there now. But it'd be great to get to that point where you have different groups are wanting to participate now. And again, you know, the panel before talking about how RFPs now are, are starting to talk about are you collaborating with other groups. You know, that, that's, those are the kind of incentive structures that need to be built to encourage various kinds of collaboration across our industry. But unfortunately, you know, incentives alone aren't going to be the only thing that we need. We also need trust. So as much of incentives that you have that are there, uh, and as great as they are, uh, it's a necessary condition, but not a sufficient condition, so we, we need to have other aspects to it. So trust is really uh, a core feature of this. So we, what we see more so than not, you can look at the status quo, is what an organization, there's a huge amount of mistrust of what an organization may do if you share it with another organization or another individual. And again, we, we see that in the, in the area of you're sharing with the government. I mean, honestly, the, the, the argument that I hear so often is, well, well you know, the government, it can't even, this is in the United States, um, actually we see it you know, across the globe, you can't even defend their own data. Look at OPM, look at the joint staff getting hacked, look at the state, and so they kind of can list off a bunch of these other uh, breaches and compromises that have gone on, and so why should we share with a, with, with a government, or why should we share with another organization if we're not sure that they're going to be able to secure the data or who they're going to give it to, and it's basically throwing it into a black box. And that's not just in the private sector, public sector, it goes across, within the government, when I was there, huge issue for sharing and data, uh, collabor uh, data sharing collaboration going across organizations, and so, again, this is just a human factor that has to be integrated along with it, uh, because if you have that mistrust, there really are, are no incentives for the sharing. And so when we're thinking about building any kind of an socioeconomic system, we gotta look at, the, look at the trust and look at how it, that's foundational and what aspects can we do to build trust uh, within, within the, the, the networked environment that we're working in. And so again, go back to the networked effects. And so instead of looking at it as a bilateral relationship, looking at a unidirectional, uh, trust requires human interaction. And so, we're generally an industry, if I were to over you know, stereotype, we have a lot of in introverts in it. You know, I'm, I'm one of the introverts, it's, you know, it's human interaction can be hard, it can be exhausting, uh, but it's something that we need to be doing. And so the reason why it's so important is because it does build that reservoir of social capital. And so social capital, and not a social science term, but basically it is, looks at the, the interactions and relationships across a group of people and what that looks like. And it's been proven that the, the more social capital they have has been linked to everything from greater levels of democracy, greater innovation, greater economic development, um, all the benefits that we want to be seeing coming out of it. And so the human interaction is, is, is essential because it, it then will support the propensity to self-organize into groups, self-organize into associations, and, and that's what we're starting to see. And just um, looking at just like one anecdote from what I've se seen here for the human interaction component, uh, one of my former colleagues, Bobby Fowler, gave a talk yesterday on machine learning and looking at identifying process child anomalies. And one of his slides at the very end was talking about the lack of data that he had that he was able to do this analysis, he was pretty comfortable with it, but still the end was a little too small, so he'd love to have some more data. By dinner yesterday night, he had two different people come up to him, each of which offering about terabytes of data for him to help improve his modeling. And so, the human interaction is important. Building up that trust, though, and understanding what was going on, that helps by coming to these conferences and seeing the research that's, that's going there. And I would argue that those two working at that level, or the three of them, I guess, in the data exchange, will probably get to the, get to the desired endpoint of you know, improving that machine learning model for greater detection, 
much faster than had it been like a big corporate, you know, formal collaborative agreement. And so when I'm talking about data sharing, it has to occur at all these different levels. We need to have the, the formal organizations that are doing it, but also that human element of the person-to-person -person interactions that are going on, which is why these kind of conferences are so important for those of us in this, in this industry to really help move the needle and help strengthen our defenses. But I thought that was just a great example um, of how, one, there are the data silos that are going on, but by coming to these kind of events and interacting with people, we can actually start to remove some of those silos and collaborate. So while trust on the human side is increasingly important and just really essential for collaboration, as an industry, we're moving towards zero trust. And I'll point out, like, I don't think that's a bad thing. I think it's really helping us move forward and helping strengthen our, defense, our defenses. Um, but it is a, it's a notion of not trusting anyone. We're denying by default. Uh, and that can refer to users' identity. Don't trust who you're sending things to, devices, applications, data, kind of across the board. And again, like, I know there are whole talks on this, and we're overwhelmed with a lot of the, the zero trust literature. But I think it's important to highlight that, on one hand, this is really great for us as far as maintaining the security of the data but it pr provides another paradox that we're in where on the technical side, we're basically building systems on, based on the absence of trust, but on social systems, we need to have much greater trust that's going on and we need to have an increasing reliance on this kind of trust. And so, again, what can we do about that? How can we move forward with that? And I would argue that uh, one key element of it could be focusing on the usability and may not seem you know, super intuitive for that. Um, and one highlight, it's not just riding the usability wave. Usability is being thrown around you know, everywhere in security now, which on the one hand, I, I, again, as someone who's done a lot, you know, decent amount of work on human-computer interaction, I'm thrilled to see security embracing a lot of this. Um, which we're fairly far behind in some other tech industries and, and the focus on usability. But, um, and you actually point out just the, the aspects of the seamless and, and um, simplification, empowerment, workflow, all those kind of things are really, really important. So while they're, on the one hand, they're marketing, it's buzzword bingo, you know, we, we've seen that everywhere. Uh, it really is in, it's, it's an essential component and it can really help get us to a point where we can craft those incentives and have um, greater trust in the system. And so how can that actually even happen? So you know, one more buzzword for us, the, the, the demystifying usability for secure sharing. And so these are just a couple elements of how I think usability could play a really strong role in helping secure sharing. And there are technical elements to it and then there are also the, the, the social elements of it. And so one is the customizable data protection. And this is where you know, these technologies are already there. And sort of the good analogy that I, that I at least think of a fair amount, um, about a month or two ago I heard a woman talking about you know, creating the green buildings. The, the, all the technology is there for us to have really green buildings now. But why aren't we doing it? Well, part of it is the systems and processes aren't in place. Incentives aren't there. The trust isn't there. There's so many reasons that are very similar to what I see here. And so I think for secure sharing, a lot of the technology is there, which doesn't mean we shouldn't still be innovating. Um, but on the back end, we can figure out as far as the various controls, who can have access, keeping track of the data, keeping track of the devices, and so forth. Where we can really innovate a bunch more is providing some of those visual cues as well. And those visual cues are really important. One, so it's, it can make it much more accessible for a broader you know, range of folks who want to be sharing data, whether it's threat intel, threat intel or any other kind of data. So that's really important. So the tech element can help pri provide that transparency, especially on the front end and how it's designed. Um, but it's also going to require that human element. So for zero trust, it only works as well as if the person, you know, for identity ma management, all those kind of aspects, if, if you're actually adhering to it. And so if you think about examples where the human element really is important, is say that someone's working in your organization, had access to a lot of data, then they're no longer working with you. Are you actually leveraging the technology to revoke their access privileges? Very often we see that doesn't happen, and they maintain access to that data even after they leave an organization. And so again, that's... The tech can only take you so far, you need to have the human element following up on it to ensure those, the controls are still being actually used and are adhered to as the social system evolves. Uh, when it comes to sharing communities, uh, we're seeing more and more on secure enclaves. I think that's an interesting area to be looking at. And, again, and just expanding the usability and the customization of the controls, I think, are really important. And then the human element. Creating the organizations that are out there. CTA is you know, a great one of, of several that are out there for encouraging the sharing. Um, integrating those together and really helping op optimize the accessibility of those sharing communities. But as we're going through it all and looking at the usability, we're really focusing on what that impact is on security and privacy, and I think that's really important. Too often we hear that you know, security and privacy, there must be some sort of trade-off with innovation and convenience. And then, like, let's not accept that. It doesn't have to be the way. 
Occasionally it may provide some friction, but let's move to an area where it's as frictionless as we, as we can get. And I think in that, that should be uh, one of our aspirations. And again, just getting back to the notion of the trust and incentives, really fostering trust through that transparency. Being able to see the visual cues that you're securing that data or you're not securing the data. Who has access to it through some various audit logs and so forth. So there's a lot of interesting work that I think can be done here and that already is being done here, which I think is what is the exciting thing about it. But if you're out there with your own community, just one thing to keep in mind, this is what we see a lot, that if it's not usable, no matter, like the best laid plans are gonna get circumvented if it doesn't fit within the workflow. So make sure it works within the workflow. Those of us who are analysts, we know that we've found ways to work around whatever kind of security uh, uh, you know, defenses might, might be in place for us. And I've seen you know, my team members have done that as well. So making sure it integrates with the workflow and helps them as opposed to being seen as something that needs to be circumvented. And so usability, you know, not just a buzzword, although it's still you know, very much one, but it's something that can be a force multiplier, it can build trust, it can help create the, the various incentives through creating the communities, and it really be an, uh, a core component of, of creating a secure sharing system. And so that went through you know, a fair amount, you're know, looking at the, the status quo of where we are, um, of some ways to really get beyond that and aspire towards uh, a better both social and technical system where we're doing the secure sharing and what the benefits are. And I think we've seen that again you know, across the Across the two days from you know, yesterday's keynote talking about playing together, that's been a theme that I've seen throughout several of the talks is really coming together as a community, which is great because we need to come together as a community right now. It's a really important time. And again, just like putting my international relations hat back on, there is the, the, the broader spread of digital authoritarianism. That's actually where most of my research tends to focus these days. And really looking at the, everything from the privacy implications of surveillance state, states and uh, facial recognition, the various data regu regulations that are going on that require data localization and access to that data. Those kind of laws are popping up. And so us as a community, are, we have both a front row seat in what's going on, but we also should be major players in ensuring what the future of the internet is going to look like, uh, both within our own countries, our own domains, but also across the globe. And so on the one hand, we can you know, kind of sit back and look at the dystopian realities. Um, had a great talk yesterday on uh, the, the, how the fiction is impacting our, our perspective of how we're going to be going as a, as a community. Um, and we can, we can sit back and, and take that and just acknowledge the FUD and just assume that the breaches are always going to happen. There's nothing we can do about it. Or we can at least aspire towards a better future, leveraging the technology, leveraging it to help ensure privacy, to help ensure uh, security, and help ensure a lot of the innovation and the collaboration that we know needs to happen to get towards that better point. And the, the good news is, from my perspective, is that all that FUD that we've been seeing, the assuming the breach, privacy debt, and so forth, all those data silos and fear, they're starting to be replaced. Uh, and they're being placed slowly, and we're not there yet. We're getting, we're, I feel like we're at the very, very beginning of that wave, which is uh, exciting, because all of us here can actually help shape that wave. Um, but we're being of really seeing where collaboration, trust, and sharing can take us as a community and actually help strengthen our defenses, help strengthen the safety of our systems, help ensure the democracies that, that um, we want to help promote, um, help provide greater innovation, reinforce the role of, of privacy as a, as a fundamental right. And, like, so many different aspects that have such far-reaching implications across society. And we're seeing this. You know, uh, Harvard Business Review just had an article last month on why are companies forming these alliances. And you know, the underlying... Uh, you know, the bottom line of that was it, it, it benefits them, right? At the end of the day, you know, organizations don't come together and collaborate if it, if it doesn't benefit them. And again, it just gets into the incentives. So the incentive structures are switching now where it is in their, in their benefit. And so these are just several very, like, of, of very different kinds uh, of collaboration. It goes from everything from something global like the um, Paris call, which has, I think, hundreds of organizations and countries at this point. Uh, Macron introduced it last November, basically calling for um, the creation of, of norms and proper behavior in cyberspace. Um, we've talked about virus total and, and the, the data can go into there. The, you know, the increase of open frameworks that we're starting to see, you know, we've seen several of them over the past few days, those are, are great. And other kinds of sharing systems, from the ISACs to the CTA, um, Charter of Trust, I and mean, there's a lot out there that are starting to pop up that are really, really essential and beneficial. And I think that they're indicative of, of, of where we're hopefully heading as an industry as we're starting to realize how to build in the incentives, how to build in the trust, how to build in more of a usability uh, across our community. And so I think that's really exciting because I think at the end of the day, our ability to do that, our ability to collaborate and build these alliances to counter 
a lot of the, trend, the negative trends that are out there as far as losing surveillance, having those bubble charts grow bigger and bigger, I think it's going to be foundational to start decreasing those bubble charts and to decreasing the number of targets that might be under, under attack. And so those of us that are here, as we, you know, as we spend the next few days you know, working together here and go back to our organizations, uh, hopefully, you know, believe in anything, is just think about how these secure sharing systems are both beneficial to you, for your organization, for the customers that you may have, with the government, um, but they're also really foundational to helping determine where we're going as an industry and, and the future of the internet, which has huge implications for, uh, I, I think, democratization and fundamental rights across the globe. And I will end it on that. Thank you.